That's based with Caleb Salvador as a comedic informative production, meaning it covers serious topics in a humorous manner. Some of the opinions expressed are satirical hyperbole. Some are not. Some of the content may not be suitable for all listeners. If you're easily offended, tune out now. We don't want pussy bleeding little bitches consuming our content. I have dementia and pooped my pants while visiting the Pope. Welcome to the That's Based Wednesday morning midweek check-in show. I am your host, as always, Caleb Salvatore. We're laughing our way through the end of days, reporting from somewhere underground, and we're brought to you by our friends over at Outlaw Streamers. Head on over to www.outlawstreamers.com to learn more. We're also brought to you by the official sponsors of That's Based, our friends over at Beach House Bar and Grill, just north of 104th Street in Omaha, Nebraska. They got something going on for you guys every single night. They got karaoke on Mondays. Tuesdays, they got poker. Wednesdays, trivia. Thursdays, music bingo, followed immediately by open mic. And then Fridays and Saturdays, they have a show, it seems like, every night. This Saturday, by the way, coming up, April 6th, my show. My show, Harmful Content Comedy, presents the hilarious... Heather Jones, Heather Jones, and a whole lot more. We get some hilarious people. I'll be hosting that show again. That's Saturday, April 6th, 8 p.m. Doors at 730. You don't want to miss it. They got food there now. It's delish as the kids do. The kids still say delish. I have no idea. I'm flying solo. Mia, the red face of white supremacy is not with me on the show as she usually is not on Wednesdays. She's a, a Saturday and Monday fixture. Nonetheless, they've also got coming up here. This Friday, Daddy Mac and the Flack at 8 p.m. Uh, Element Band on the 12th at 8 p.m. That's a Friday. Girls Night out on the 13th. I'm sure that'll hit really well with our audience. The 19th, Blue Venue at 8 p.m. The 20th, DJ Star at 9, 420. Go blaze it, right? DJ Star with Is A Vibe. I'm by bit. Go get high. Responsibly. Not really. Because this is Nebraska and it's not legal there. But, you know, I know what you guys are going to do. I Do your thing. I don't smoke anymore, but those of you that do, I'm happy for you. Uh, Burlesque on the 26th, Ed Archibald on the 27th, and then Bobcat and Graham Good on April 28th, rounding out the the month. Go to beachhouse-omaha.com to learn more. Tickets are available at the door and online for my show. It's $10 cash at the door or on eTix. Again, that's this Saturday, the 6th of April, Beach House Bar and Grill, just north of 104th Street in Omaha, Nebraska. Doors at 7.30, show at 8. A lot of hilarious people on that show. All right. All right. Oh, and we got the we got the hundred hundredth episode coming up pretty soon here. Oh, I know we've done more than a hundred episodes, but this is like the hundredth real episode that we've been doing with like video and all that. So this this will be the actual hundredth episode, hundredth real official episode. So I'll hopefully have something special going on for you there. We'll we'll get some old faces back. We'll have a BS session or something like that. I don't know. Um, that'll probably be the Wednesday show which will be next Wednesday, the 10th. Because remember, we got Dan Osborne interview with a guy that could very well, if the polls are any indicator, be the swing vote in the Senate. Coming up here. It's a big election cycle. This guy could determine a lot of things. It's probably best that you hear him out and get yourself educated, especially if you're in Nebraska. All right, which I know a lot of our listeners are. All right, nonetheless, we got a lot of stuff to get into for the midweek check-in this week. We have got... Uh, Some inconsistencies with the voter registration. A follow-up on the Easter thing. A Candace Owens update. RFK is, of course, making some waves for reasons other than his adulterous whore of a VP. And then Nebraska is is looking at making some changes to how their electoral votes are counted. That's what we got this week on That Space. Let's first off, let's start off with uh, some interesting news from the Social Security Administration. So the Social Security Administration tracks voter attempts, specifically voter attempts without identification, registration. And these are registrations that have gone through. This is an, oh, they failed and we thwarted them. These are registrations that have gone through. So they don't have a photo identification, so they brought things like mail, social security, whatever, right? Some type of identification. So I'll read a couple of states off to you for the last week, for the total uh, matches. And you guys, let me know what you think. Let me know if you notice any uh, disparities with some of these states. So total matches for registered voters without ID in the state of Colorado, 388. 
total matches in the state of Kansas. 1,540. Okay? Not crazy. In the state of Louisiana, 91. In the state of Montana, 388. In the state of New Hampshire, zero. In the state of Ohio, 72. 466 in Florida. 2,086 in California. 499 in New York. And then there's a couple numbers that really stick out here. Those numbers don't mean anything to you to you until I read you the context of the next ones. Arizona, 24,620. Compare that to California, which had 2,086. And less stringent voter registration was. 24,620 new registered voters that did not present photo identification in the last week in the state of Arizona compared to 2086 in California. Now, I am not, I I don't work for the Census Bureau. But last time I checked, Arizona doesn't have 12 times the population of California. That's one of them. And then Texas. Texas registered. 49,957. Pennsylvania registered 27,807. Three real weird states that jump out there. Real weird states that have had a big surge in registered voters that did not present IDs. That's not it, though. Here's the numbers for, for the year. That's not a fluke. Blo- skyrocketing. No, no one's seen voters registered without a photo ID at the same rate as these three states. Texas has seen since the beginning of the year, 2024, we're talking three months, four months, 1,250,710 registered voters without a photo ID in the state of Texas. Pennsylvania has seen 580,000 513 registered voters without a a photo ID. Arizona, 220,731. Since the beginning of the year. Let me let me break down the state uh, state by state results for 2020. Remember, 1.5 or 1.25 million registered voters without photo ID in Texas this year in three in four months. Donald Trump won the state of Texas in 2020 by 600,000 votes. The state of Arizona, which got 250,000 or 220,000 new voters unregistered without ID. Was an 11,000 vote swing in 2020. 11,000 votes decided it. Pennsylvania. 580,000 was less than 100,000 votes decided it. That was the margin. The fix is fucking in. The Democrats allowed people into this country, not checking who the hell they were, and then said anyone who dares say that we're doing this to bring in a bunch of voters is a white supremacist, racist conspiracy theorist. Tell me why the only three states that are seeing this type of a surge are three key swing states that would tip the election. I'm telling you right now, if Texas turns blue, there's never going to be the Republican Party's dead. Why are three swing states, three swing states that they know are key and they're trending downward in the polls in the only three states that have seen this surge in unregistered voters who didn't verify who the hell they were. Some weird numbers there, if you ask me. It's a little odd, if you ask me. They cheat two ways, though. 
when they bring people in from when they bring people in, they cheat two different ways. So they bring people in illegally, knowing that red states aren't going to count them on the census. Right. But blue states will. So when they fill states like California and they fill states like wherever, right? No, well-known blue states with illegal immigrants. What do they do? They count toward more elect. They count toward a higher population, which gets them more congressional seats and more electoral votes. So even the ones that don't register to vote are still screwing us over. So tell me, can someone tell me? I would love for someone to explain this to me and tell me it's all going to be okay. 1.25 million new registered voters without a photo ID in the state of Texas since the beginning of 2024. Texas, the state that the Democrats have been trying to turn blue, and they're almost there. It's per- it, it, it may not be purple, but it's encroaching on purple. Arizona, a state they have succeeded in turning purple. This is uh, this is a pattern. They did this with California. They they or they turned California straight blue. They turned Arizona purple and now they're coming for Texas. And they repeat this strategy over and over and over again. So you can register to vote. All you need are the last four digits of a social security number. In many states. So in a lot of these states, illegal immigrants can't get a driver's license, but they can get a social security number for work. So if they're in their, they're over overstaying their visa, they have a social security number. All you need are the last four digits of a social security number, which they all have, or most of them have, to register to vote. Folks, here's the thing. This is your October surprise in April. Illegal immigrants, more often than not, I'd wager to say, don't take polls. So when you look at these polls that say Trump's ahead by four points in Arizona, we now have to adjust. Remember what I said? It's like playing the Kansas City Chiefs. If you're going to win that game, you better be up by three scores going into the fourth quarter because you got to account for all the tomfoolery the refs are about to pull. Here's your here's your officiating. So when you see a, a poll that says Trump's up by three or four points in Arizona, he's down by two or three. If these numbers mean anything. When you see a poll that says Trump's up by eight in Texas, it's probably tied. I'm not saying all these people are going to vote. I'm not saying they're all going to vote for Biden, but I guarantee you it'll be a four to one ratio. The ones that do. There's your October surprise. This is how it gets stolen. The fix is in. I mean, this is as egregious as it gets when it comes to evidence that they're about to steal this election. And they'll call you a racist and a white supremacist and a conspiracy theorist for raising these concerns. But th- these numbers right here, and you, you can go look for yourself. This is on the Social Security Administration's website. I didn't pull this off of InfoWars. You can go look at this for yourself. This is their plan to steal Texas. This is from End Wokeness on Twitter, but looked into this myself too. Um, people don't realize California was a red state for a long time. In the mid-1900s, Republicans won eight out of nine presidential elections in California. Go look it up. Eight out of nine dog walked them. So it, it wasn't Mississippi red, but it was, I don't what's a good example? Um, Ohio, Iowa red, North Carolina red, red enough, right? Like maybe it can flip. It's going to be Texas red. That's probably a better one. Actually, it's perfect for the analogy we're making right now. It was Texas red. So it was light red, but it was red. California. Deep blue California. All of California. Los Angeles. Republicans won six out of nine elections. Presidential elections. 
all of California was red. You know what happened? You know when that changed? 1988. 1988, that changed. George H.W. Bush was the first Republican to lose it. And we never looked back. Haven't won one since. You know what happened? In 1986, Ronald Reagan cut a deal with the Democrats. I know, that's our conservative hero, Ronald Reagan. Oh, he's such a great guy, except that he hated guns, and he's why we're about to get fucked again. Ronald Reagan, that Ronald Reagan, our conservative hero, that we continue to ball wash in in Republican debates in 2024. Hello, move on. That Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan cut a deal with the Democrats in 1986 to grant amnesty to illegal immigrants, over half of which lived, guess where, California, and the Republicans haven't won an election in California since. If Biden wins, a lame duck Joe Biden will grant amnesty to all of the illegal immigrants in Texas. He will pack the Supreme Court because he knows he can't get away with that in his first term. He will pack the Supreme Court in his second term. So it can't be declared unconstitutional. The Democrats will win Texas, Arizona, and Nevada in every election cycle moving forward, and we will effectively become a one-party nation. Then we're talking civil war. Then we're talking secession. Because you essentially, if you're right of center, become a second-class citizen. You're living, I mean, you're basically, you might as well, it, it would be, the national equivalent of a Republican living in D.C. or California, Illinois, wherever. You're an insurgency that's a little bit of a mosquito pest to the party in power from time to time. Or a Democrat in Nebraska. Every now and then you pull off the upset in one or two elections, but you never do much. That's what'll happen. If they get away with this. And the problem now is I don't know how to stop it. The cat's out of the bag. You've got the margin of error in three key swing states has just been made up in four months, not even four months. Unprecedented spikes in unre- or in registered voters without photo IDs. Can someone tell me how this isn't cheating? The fix is in. They're doing it in front of your faces. And I don't know what to do. I don't know how you fix this. I I truly, I don't know how this gets fixed. I don't know how this gets resolved. Because how do you prove? I mean, what do you do at this point? Unless you're going to start, unless these states are going to start requiring photo IDs and then it's going to get caught up in the courts and they'll just stall. Because that's what they do is they just stall. They sue and they stall. In the courts, because they know it's it by the time it gets to the Supreme Court, who says, oh, yeah, you're right. Or any judge, for that matter, the election will be over and there's not much you can do. Because that's what they do. They put it on the credit card and stall. Just wait. By then, it's too late. Go. Yeah. They cheated. Yeah, a lot of people voted that shouldn't have, but go prove that the burden of proof is on the accuser. So go prove that that's what tipped the scale in Texas or Arizona or whatever. That's not good. That's not good. We can no longer, this means we can no longer trust any poll because we have no idea the wave of voters that has just come over our border. We have no idea. The Pandora's shit box that we just opened. This is why conservatives were concerned about the border situation. It wasn't because we hate brown people or his, or whatever. That, that wasn't the reason. It never was. They painted us that they painted us that way because they're gaslighters. That's what they do best. They do it better than anybody. 
But the reality is we saw this for what it was. We said, hey, they're trying to bring in a whole new batch of voters that they've welcomed into this country with open arms and given social services to free money. I mean, I saw uh, I believe it's the, the, the number I read the other day. An illegal immigrant gets seven times the benefits in this country that a military family does. That's completely insanity. That's complete insanity. But the party that welcomed this whole new batch of voters into all these states that so happen to be swing states is the one they're going to vote for. Even if they they figure out in a couple of years, hey, maybe a bunch of Roman Catholics from South America don't align with transitioning kids ideolo- or ideologically, but it doesn't matter at that point. They've already gotten their way. They got their one party state. They've packed the Supreme Court and they'll rig every election going forward. So maybe we weren't concerned about brown people. I'll tell you, I'd much rather have a Hispanic, like a, a, a South American neighbor, a Hispanic guy from South America, than a blue-haired liberal feminist. I'd much rather live next door to that guy. Much rather. I'd much rather work with that guy. I'd much rather hire him to do a job at my... Anything. Anything. But they need to come through legally. We can't just let everyone in because we were saying this whole time, hey, it ain't about the race. We don't care if they come through legally or where they come from. But these people can get social security cards and they can register to vote. We were screaming that from the rooftop and you went, oh, that's racist. That's the great replacement theory. You're white supremacist, blah, blah. No, we were pointing out how you guys were actively cheating and preparing to steal the next 12 elections. It was never about race, believe it or not. It was never about geography, religion, any of that. It was about one party bribing people to come here and then registering them to vote. So it'll, we'll, we'll keep an eye on this for you. We'll keep following this story here because I've, I've got a feeling this is far from the last we're going to hear of this. And this, this, it just, it don't look good, man. You look at historical trends. They did the same thing in California, same thing in Arizona. Arizona has been trending blue for a long time and it directly correlates with this nonsense going on at the border. Now they got a democratic governor. Good luck. Who oversaw her own election, by the way. Totally fair. Totally fair. Totally fair. When the uh, conservative districts of Maricopa County all have polling machines go down at the same time, but none of the liberal ones have that problem. They say, hey, just re- just hand us your ballot. We'll take it downtown and count it for you. Total, totally on the up and up. Nothing wrong going on there. No foul play whatsoever in the uh, 2022 Arizona gubernatorial election. I hate that word. I just call it the governor race. How about that? That's what I always love, though. I just love when you see these get out the vote rallies. They're trying to encourage people to vote. They're trying. Let's let's call it what it is. They're trying to encourage low information voters to vote. Voters that are educated on the issues and know where they stand don't need some jackass to knock on their door and say, "Hey, tomorrow's election day. Get out and vote." They know that. If you need to be reminded to get out and vote, you probably shouldn't be voting. If you need to be reminded of when election day is by a stranger at your door, probably shouldn't be voting. They push for that because they win when more low info voters go to the polls. That's why I always get a chuckle when they're like, well, when when voter turnout is low, Republicans usually win. I'm like, yeah, that's not really the own you guys think it is. Low voter turnout typically means that the people who are actually voting in this election are people that have studied the issues and know where they stand on things. So you mean when Republicans win, it's because less low information voters that didn't know what the hell was going on in the world and just walked in at the last second and checked the box because the candidate was popular showed up to the polls. That's not really the own. Hey, we have the dumber voting base. When only the people that know what's going on in the world show up to vote, we usually lose. Not really the flex you think it is. Okay. All right, next up, we got uh, more on the Easter situation. More on the Easter situation. So that is blown up. Absolutely blown up. And credit where it's due. Chris Cuomo made an excellent, yes, Andrew's brother, Meatball Cuomo, as Tim Dillon calls him, made an excellent point 
on the t- on the uh, PBD podcast with Patrick Bet David the other day. I I couldn't have put this any better myself. And as American History X says, sometimes if you can't top it, just steal the quote and use that. Chris Cuomo, to paraphrase, on this trans day of visibility, he said, if the administration, the Biden administration, if their intention was truly to help transgender people become more accepted in the United States, they couldn't have done it any worse than what they just did. Because that's not how you help a minority group improve their status in this country. You don't do it by alienating the religion that makes up the majority of the population and pitting them against each other. And yes, I understand Trans Day of Visibility has been on March 31st for 15 years. I understand that. Here's my issue. There's a difference between a corporate holiday where Target puts up transgender dog toys and the President of the United States signing a declaration declaring it that. This President's done that twice. Easter and right after a mass shooting where a trans shooter killed a bunch of Christian kids. There's our problem. That's the issue with it. The declaration is a middle finger. And then to come out after you get called out on it and double down, or in Biden's case, say, I never did that, which he may not think he did that. He may, I mean, he does have dementia, right? He does have dementia. And um, he, he, the guy doesn't even know what year it is. He may truly not remember doing that or may not have been the one that made that decision and they just told him to sign something, um, you know, because he thought it was a, he was going to get him free ice cream or something like that. But this is a pattern of behavior with this administration, like I just said, with the trans mass shooter situation. And then you also have, if it was just the trans day of visibility this one time, yeah, people would have been pissed. But when you have the pattern of behavior where you did it right after the mass shooting and then where you turn around, where, the mass shooting where instead of, you know, are you know, like actually giving a fuck about the victims like you would have done if it was any other group other than Christians, you instead turn around and fawn over transgenders and talk about who's so oppressed, those poor babies. Because, you know, uh, oppressed people frequently get deals with Bud Light, right? But instead of turning around and fawning about transgenders, that that's where people had the issue there, by the way. But they also remove the religious symbolism from all of the Easter decorations at the White House egg hunt for the festivities. So this is a pattern of behavior. This isn't a one-off situation where you had bad luck and it just so happened to fall on on, on a holy day. This is a pattern of behavior with this administration, with the trans thing. Because it's about gaslighting you. How do we get people to accept something so ridiculous? So absurd. And label anyone that has any type of question about it, this horrific bigot. How do we do that? It's like in 1984, two plus two equals five. The party's word is gospel. You do not question it. Men can get pregnant. Women can be men. Children can cut their junk off and change their genders. Here's another problem. This is the Instagram post from the official White House account. And I'm not being petty. I'm not splitting hair. They open this can of worms. They can deal with the dirt that's in it. To quote legendary uh, prophet and rapper from Detroit, Royce the Five Nine. Their Happy Easter post said, Happy Easter. That's it. Okay, cool. So I'm assuming Happy Trans Day of Visibility followed. No, 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 no. Today, we send a message to all transgender Americans. You are loved. You are heard. You are understand. You belong. President Biden. No happy Easter to our Christian friends, Christian brothers and sisters. Just happy Easter. Happy Easter with Easter eggs and flowers. Because that's, remember, we played that video of Paul Harvey saying, if I were the devil, he made all those bold predictions that came true. He said, if one of the things he said, if I were the devil... 
I would change the symbol of Easter from a cross to an egg. Well, the official White House post changed it from a cross to an egg. Compare it to Ramadan. Of all the Islamic symbology on their Ramadan post, which they should. You should honor people's religions or just not talk about any of them. How about that? The Biden-Harris administration wishes our Muslim communities in the United States and across the world a blessed Ramadan. Where was that for Easter? I don't feel that's a big ask. I don't feel, I don't feel this is ridiculous. This is important. This administration continuously takes jabs at the Christian community and only the Christian community. Everyone else, you can go down and look. There's any other holiday, Hanukkah, you name it. They specifically wish a happy holiday to the religion, to every holiday, or excuse me, to every religion with the exception of Christians. Every single time. Here's another thing they did. Because I do believe, like we talk about how communists have their, their useful idiots. Oh, by the way, oh, Pelosi also wished people a happy um, Cesar Chavez day. I, they're doing, these people are doing a bit at this point. The South American communist on Easter. Of course, it's just happy Easter, but then happy Cesar Chavez day. I'll, I'll read it like her. His legacy is his fearless and tireless champion for justice and dignity for all our communities. I'm not drunk enough. Sorry, I can't do it. But it's a long winded post again. These things matter. Words matter with these people. That's what I've noticed. Politicians are very calculated. I mean, you'll get the people that like the Donald Trumps of the world that go off the cuff and just say random shit. But these calculated career politicians, they word things and phrase things intentionally. Every time. Here's what else they did. And we talk on this show about how the establishment wants to eliminate the American family, eliminate the religious values, because when you don't have a father figure and you don't have a God figure in your life, well, who takes both of those roles on? The government. It's what communist con- Mao Zedong did it in China with the Cultural Revolution. So we've talked about how they want to do that. Let's think about this for a second. By making that declaration, and instead of just letting it fly or apologize and say, hey, we know this is poor taste, this is the day it falls on, whatever, they chose to double down and they chose to say, because here, believe me, if they had done this, if this day had fallen on a Muslim holiday and they declared it, uh, and they begrudge, or excuse me, and they carelessly declared this Muslim holiday to be trans day of visibility, they absolutely would have come out and apologized. We did not mean to hurt the Muslim community. We believe in celebrating diversity regardless of who, blah, 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 blah. Our deepest apologies. No. They called people that had a problem with this stupid. They called them bigoted. They called them a basket full of deplorables, more or less. So they doubled down and said anyone who has a problem with this is a moron and a bigot and a piece of trash. Because it's about enraging Christians, right? So here's what Jesus' followers were focused on on the most holy day, on the holiest of days. They weren't talking about Jesus. They weren't talking about God. They weren't talking about redemption and resurrection in the Bible. They weren't, none of that. They were talking about transgenders. The Biden administration attempted and succeeded to get Christians around the country, around the world, honestly, on the holiest of days to not talk about God, not talk about Jesus, not talk about the resurrection, but to talk about transgenders. And that is the greatest evil of all of this. He knew if that wasn't their goal, they wouldn't have doubled down. They would have apologized, said, hey, you know, it just happened to fall on the same day. Our bad. They would have apologized. They wouldn't have doubled down and they wouldn't have thrown out name calling and labels for anyone that was a little questionable about this. But they took the focus off of Jesus on Easter. And if that isn't fucking satanic and that isn't the work of the devil, I don't know what is. So when I say that these people are demons, tell me if you could find an example of something more demonic than intentionally enraging people on the holiest of days 
the anniversary, you know, on, on the day of the, where, where we celebrate the resurrection and shifting their focus to forget transgenders to anything, to anything that would upset them to that degree. They know what they're doing. They're demons from hell. They're fucking possessed. I get, but I know Alex Jones had his thing about how Obama and Hillary smell like sulfur. I believe it. I've never been in the same room with any of these people. I believe it. I bet they do smell a little sulfury. Because that's the work of the fucking Antichrist. That's the work of the fucking devil. All right, next up, we got uh, Candace Owens. We got an update. We'll stay on this religious trend here for a little bit longer. Candace Owens, there have been some rumblings coming out. Remember, she was let go of the Daily Wire. She had some public disagreements with one of her bosses, Ben Shapiro, about the Israel-Palestine thing. It's coming out, and this is alleged. We don't have concrete, solid evidence of this like we do millions of people in Texas registering to vote without an ID. That was loud. Sorry. I'm on my phone, not my laptop today for my, my show notes. But we have, there have been some rumblings come out that said Candace Owens was fired for saying Christ is king. For saying Christ is king. And immediately the establishment conservatives went on the defense for this. Saying that the term, I'm not kidding, this all comes a couple of days before the Easter debacle. Saying that the term Christ is king is anti-Semitic. Christ is king is anti-Semitic. They say it's turning a shoulder to God's chosen people and telling them that they won't be welcomed in the, in the, into the kingdom of heaven, blah, 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 because it's about Christ is king, every knee will bow, right? Somehow that's anti-Semitic. That's it for a little bit. Again, one, uh, what other religion do we do this to? Every religion has a similar saying to Christ is king. We don't label any of them anti-Semitic or Islamophobic or anti-Christian or anything like that. There's only one religion that we focus on for this, and it's Christians. Why? It's because we put up with it, number one. And Candace will be fine. I'm not, she's going to do big things. She had one foot out the door anyway. It is what it is. She's going to do her thing. I'm not even her biggest fan. She'll be fine. She'll do her thing. She'll make her money. She'll get her word across, and she won't have to bow to anybody other than Jesus, right? Here's my problem with this. And I don't think this is going to cripple the Daily Wire. I don't think that, because I've had, had people asking me, do you think that this is the end of the Daily Wire as we know it? Did they just dig their grit? No, I don't think it's, I don't think it's anything like that. Um, they're a brand. Ben Shapiro, Matt Walsh, Michael Nels, they have a big enough audience base. Jordan Peterson, who they just signed recently, they have a big enough audience base that they're not going to go under anytime soon. Here's the problem, though, is you have just significantly cut off any growth that you have, any potential growth you had. You have just strangled that. Because here's the thing with the Daily Wire. That's correct. They're a publisher. They don't have to publish something they don't agree with. They're a private company. If they don't like what you're saying on their platform, sure, they can fire you. They can get rid of you, whatever. But the Daily Wire... The value of that company rests on it being pro-free speech, it letting people say whatever they want to say, as long as it doesn't. That's what we say at Outlaw Streamers. I can say whatever I want on this show as long as it doesn't get us in court, right? So I can't defame people. I can't threaten people. I can't tell you to go kill somebody. I can't do anything like that. Other than that, I can say whatever the hell I want. As long as it gets hits, people don't care. Or the, the, my bosses don't care. That's it. The value of Daily Wire as a company is entirely contingent upon whether or not it supports the principles in which it was founded upon. One of those principles being freedom of speech. So when you claim to be against cancel culture and fighting this war against all the all these crazy liberals that are canceling people and then turn around and cancel someone for saying Christ is king, allegedly. You've just made yourself hypocrites. And anyone that was right of center and was saying, you know what? I'm tired of these liberals canceling people 
and uh, dominating media and running anybody out with a dissenting opinion. I want to go turn to a network that's going to push free speech. They're going to bring on differing, you know, opposing viewpoints, different opinions, and I'll, they'll duke it out on there and they'll be respectful about it. But they're done. They're not coming to your network now. Because you just left a nasty taste in their mouth. And it doesn't matter what your reasoning was. You just left a nasty taste in these people's mouths. And there's no way in hell they want anything to do with you. Christ is king, by the way. Sue me. I love Jews. Get Spencer Gordon back on the show. He's our token Jew. We bring, we bring one of the chosen people on every now and then. No, he's uh, he does a great job on the show. We love Spencer. The audience loves Spencer. It's always it's always a good time when he's on here. Um, okay, all right. Next up, we got RFK gave an interesting interview where he went on the attack against Dementia Man. Go ahead and check this video out here. But do you really believe that when people talk about the threat to democracy that Trump poses, do you really think that that is 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 an equal yeah, evil I mean, to I, Biden? I, I mean, listen, I can make the argument. That President Biden is a much worse threat to democracy. And the reason for that is President Biden is the first candidate in history, the first president in history that has used the federal agencies to censor political speech, so to censor his opponent. I, you know, I can say that because I just won a case in the Federal Court of Appeals and now before the Supreme Court that shows that he started censoring not just me. 37 hours after he took the oath of office, he was censoring me. No president in the country has ever done that. The greatest threat in democracy is not somebody who questions election returns, but a president of the United States who used the power of his office to force the social media companies, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, to open a portal and give access to that portal to the FBI, to the CIA, to the IRS, to CISA, to NIH, to censor his political critics. President Biden, for the first first president in history, to use the secret, his power over the Secret Service, to deny Secret Service protection to one of his political opponents for political reasons. He's weaponizing the federal agencies. Those are really critical threats Donald to democracy. Trump, of course. And of course, she goes back to Trump because that, that's their response with the that's the establishment's response. Anytime someone criticizes Biden and they know it's a justifiable criticism, they bounce back to Trump. Well, Trump did. But he's not talking about Trump. You asked who was a bigger threat to democracy. He said Biden. And he's correct. Did Trump question ele- question an election? Sure. We can sit here and have the January 6th debate till we're blue in the face. But Joe Biden, what he has done is much, 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 much more egregious than anything Trump's done. Much more of a threat to our democracy than anything Donald Trump has done. Way more than January 6th. Yes, I consider actually a republic because we are a republic. The president of the United States colluding with tech companies, which control well over half the the um, information and news consumption in this country now colluding with tech companies to suppress stories about him in which are negative and shut down the speech of his political opponents and throttle their accounts is a much greater threat to our republic and our democracy, whatever you want to call it, than Donald Trump telling people to go protest an election. That's not even my opinion. That's a fact. That's an objective fact. It was proven that Biden and his administration were doing this. Proven. So it's interesting. I made the prediction um, after he picked his VP that Kennedy was going to be that Ross Perot thorn in Joe Biden's side. And this interview backs that up. He did attack Trump, not not nearly as much shortly after he said he, he did concede, sure, you know, refusing to except the results of an election is a threat to our democracy, but what Biden did was much worse. So, clearly he's going on the attack against Biden, though, right? RFK is cementing what he's going to do in this election. He is the spoiler candidate for Biden. He is the spoiler candidate for Biden. He will do, I know there was talk about him joining Trump's campaign as the VP. He will do Donald Trump much, much, much more good running as an independent than he will as a VP. He will be that thorn in Biden's side that's attacking him, not from the right, 
but from the left. And him picking a borderline socialist, which will unite a lot of people on the hard left, as his VP, a longtime Democratic Party donor, as his VP with deep ties to big tech. A little too deep, if you know what I mean. But with deep ties to big tech. As his running mate. Solidifies my theory, in my opinion. And that gets dangerous. That gets dangerous, because like I said, this is the, the-, the theme for this year on this show, desperate people do desperate things when their power structure is threatened. If RFK is going to continue to be this thorn in Biden's side, we have to look at the pattern of behavior here. This is a very, this administration is very, very habitual. So we have to look at the pattern of behavior here. What did Biden's administration do? What did Bi- the Biden administration do a couple months ago when Kennedy was running for president? He was polling at about 25% in the Democratic Party, 25 to 30% in the Democratic primary before he switched to independent. He said, hey, we're way above the polling thresholds here. That means I get Secret Service protection. And Biden did something unprecedented. The first president in United States history to deny Secret Service protection to one of his opponents. You can look it up. Just what... One more notch in his belt. What a great job he's done, right? Totally not a tyrant and a threat to our democracy. Denied Secret Service protection to an opponent that was polling well above the threshold. So again, we have to look at patterns here. You've got a guy who's a constant thorn in your side. He's gone on the attack against you. He's basically become Trump's attack dog, right? He's got the last name Kennedy. And you've denied him Secret Service protection. Where does this go? Put your thinking caps on. Tell me where you get, where do you guys think this goes? How do you think this ends? Does it end with a convertible ride in Dallas? Is that what they're setting up here? Desperate people do desperate things, and the problem is they could whack this guy on national television in the middle of a rally while he was bashing Biden. And there's enough dumb, blue-pilled voters out there that would fall in line with the, anyone who thinks we had something to do with this after, you know, we've uh, denied this guy protection from Secret Service is a conspiracy theorist and a right-wing extremist and a threat to our democracy, a MAGA, white supremacist, racist, blah, blah, blah. There's enough 40% of the country would buy that line of bullshit because they're so brainwashed. They just go along with anything they're told by the mainstream media and the Democratic Party. Period. Period. Ah, period. Uh. I love that sound effect. I like this one better, though. Rabbi Butt Butt Plug. plug. Rabbi Butt Plug. plug. Rabbi Butt Plug. All right, this is the last one here. So my home state, Nebraska is one of two states in the country that divvies up their electoral votes a little bit differently. Now, every Texas, Wyoming, California, Colorado, New Hampshire, New Mexico, all of them, whoever gets the most votes in the state, even if you get one more vote than your opponent, gets all of their electoral votes. Well, Nebraska and Maine do it a little bit differently. Maine has four electoral votes. Nebraska has five. They break it up into their congressional districts. So you get Nebraska has three congressional districts. Maine has two. So you get three, excuse me, each district is one vote, one electoral vote, and then whoever wins the whole state in Nebraska gets the other two. Same with Maine. You get one electoral vote each, and then the other two. Um, Nebraska, typically, District 3 is pretty dark red. It's actually the most dark red in the country. More, more conservative and Republican than Wyoming, than Utah, than all of the traditional dark red states, right? District 2, which is where I'm from, that I don't live there anymore, but District 2, which is the Omaha metro area, tends to be a little bit more liberal. It's a a city. There's more registered Democrats in Omaha than there are registered Republicans. It is what it is. Um, But Omaha tends to be a little bit more liberal. Biden won it last year or last election in 2020. Every year, the, the congressional races there are within a few percentage points. Obama won it in 2008. And it's always close no matter which way it goes. It's very much a purple swing district. I know we had Dan Fry on here and he disagreed with me a couple weeks ago. It is a purple district. Um, 
it, it, it's it's more leaning conservative when it comes to congressional races, yes, but it, it's a flip a coin district. It's one of the most competitive in the country year in and year out. By the way, if you're a Republican in uh, Nebraska's second district, vote Dan Fry. We had him on the show. Great interview. Go watch it. He, uh, it it's time to fix Washington. It's time to fix this country. Fuck Washington. So that, that's my official endorsement. Fuck Washington. Vote Dan Fry. There you go. Put that on his Wikipedia page for endorsements. Caleb Salvatore. And then just that little clip in the, the, uh, the sources there. You know, Wikipedia, the bastion of infinite knowledge. So there is a bill in Nebraska's unicameral because they don't do a house and Senate. They just have one house for the legislative branch that would turn Nebraska into a winner take all state. Now here, think about this. If Donald Trump were to flip Georgia, Arizona, and Nevada, and no other states from the last election, he would still lose by two electoral votes, 270 to 268. You need 270 to win, otherwise it goes to the House of Representatives, right? If nobody gets 270. The reason he would lose would be, it wouldn't be California, it wouldn't be Illinois, it wouldn't be New York, it wouldn't be the you know, Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania swing states. It would be good old, dear old Nebraska U. We would give him, we would give that one electoral vote to Biden. So Republicans in the unicameral said, hey, we're going to, we're going to change this. The governor, Jim Pillen, said, I support this. Let's get this changed. Let's turn this state, like 48 other states and D.C., into a winner-take-all state. No more splitting the electoral votes up. That's not how this works. This is a statewide election for this office. This is not a... Is, we break it down for Congress. We break it down for state, senate, county offices. It's not, there, there's no reason to. He's not running to be president of Nebraska's second district. He's running to be president of the country. The states vote. So, there's been a lot of pushback on this, of course, right? Because can't do anything without pushback from unhinged lunatics. There's been a lot of pushback on this. And some of the pushback, all of the pushback, I think is hilarious because it's hypocritical. They're saying they're, 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 this is voter suppression and they're stifling the voices of liberal voters in Omaha. No, they're not. No, they're not. You have a voice for Congress when, or when you vote for Congress. You have a voice when you vote for your state Senate county offices, for mayor, city council. You have a voice in all of those instances. And you have a voice when you vote for president. Just in statewide races, sometimes your voice is drowned out by other people. That's how this precious democracy that you guys claim to love so much works. So, here's my thing. If you're upset that voices in blue cities in otherwise red states are being suppressed, how come I haven't heard you guys complaining about all the voters in you know, Orange County, California that are being suppressed by living in a winner-take-all state? All of the voters in upstate New York, rural Colorado, Illinois, New Mexico, Minnesota, the rural, the rural areas in those states. How come I don't hear you guys complaining about those people having their votes suppressed? How come the only people, when we talk about voter suppression, quote unquote, which 99% of the time is bullshit, how come the only time we talk about voter suppression, you're concerned about liberal voices being suppressed? You don't care about anyone else. The only voter, the only voter suppression taking place is happening in red states, if you ask these people. It's, it's a complete, it's, it's batshit crazy. These people are borderline schizophrenic, man. I'm not a doctor, but I'm going to do is look at it. Absurd. Uh, big shout out to our sponsors, Drink Blood of Tyrants. Uh, drinkbloodoftyrants.com, promo code BASED, B-A-S-E-D, like the title of the show, going to save you 10% off your order on either their Red Merlot wine, their White Tears of Tyrants wine, or the Liquid Freedom Energy Drink. The Liquid Freedom Energy Drink, by the way, comes with zero calories, zero sugar, zero carbs, and zero fucks given. All natural ingredients. It's not all natural, but the ingredients are. you got to remember, i got to clarify, or I can get sued. Because it'd be false advertisement there. But it is all natural ingredients. Again, you head over to drinkbloodoftyrants.com. 
Use the promo code BASED, B-A-S-E-D, like the title of the show. Going to save you 10% off your order on any of those kick-ass products, and you're going to make me a little bit of money in the process. I appreciate that. Um, we have got, again, like I said, we'll have another episode before the Saturday Big Show, which airs 9 a.m. Central Standard Time every Saturday. Uh, we will have the Friday interview at 9 a.m. CST with Dan Osborne. Dan Osborne, independent runner for Senate, could very well be the swing vote that affects a lot of stuff, especially if we get, you know, like a a Democratic president with a Republican Senate and a Republican House or a Republican president with a Democratic Senate and a Democratic House. Dan Osborne could be a very, very influential man taking on that Joe Manchin role. I mean, Joe Manchin, if you, if you really think about it, Joe Man, yeah, Biden was the president for the last four years. But there were two senators named Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema that basically ran the country because everything that happened in this country had to go through them first. They were the swing vote. Those two are going to be gone. Neither of them are running for re-election. Right? They're going to be replaced. Manchin by a hardline Republican. Cinema, it's up in the air. It could go red or blue. There's a very, very good chance Dan Osborne could take that role on. He's leading in the polls right now. There's no, it's the perfect storm. There's no Democrat running. He is, um, you've got a Republican. that's pretty establishment. Establishment Republicans in Nebraska have alienated a lot of their base. This guy's not a Democrat. He's not a socialist. He's not a liberal. So he's going to attract a lot of people from the middle. This Nebraska voters could very well have the man that has that Joe Manchin role and more or less assumes the role of president by proxy. Because nothing in this country can get done unless it goes through him. That is a very, very powerful position of a very, very interesting man that we're going to be interviewing right here on That's Based Friday, 9 a.m. Central Standard Time. You want to check that out wherever you get your shows, Rumble, Apple Podcasts, iHeart, Spreaker, you name it. Interesting guy. I can't wait to talk with him. That's all I got. We'll see you Friday and Saturday. You know the drill. Cheat on your taxes, not your spouse. And as always, stay based.